Thanks for joining us, everyone. We're here today to have a conversation about seals and sealing. The seal hunt began on April 8th, and uh, this year I think there are expected to be somewhere between 27 and uh, roughly 32 vessels uh, at the hunt. I've invited four guests for a conversation today. Eldred Woodford is a longtime fisherman and sealer. He's president of the Canadian Sealers Association and member of the Inshore Council of the Fish Food and Allied Workers Union. Next, we have Dion Dakins, who is CEO of Carino Processing Limited, a company that processes seal products located in Dildo, Newfoundland. Jen Shears is owner of Natural Boutique, a store selling seal fur products. Jen is also an advocate of wildlife management and food security through sustainable hunting, which of course would include the seal hunt. And Shane Mahoney is world-renowned conservationist and president and CEO of Conservation Visions. Shane also wrote a documentary about the Newfoundland seal hunt called Ice Seals and men. So I first want to acknowledge Shane Mahoney actually because uh, it was Shane who prompted me to organize uh, this discussion. Um, a few months ago we had a chat about the upcoming seal hunt and and where do we go in this province from here with this seal hunt? Uh, the participation um, has been less in, in uh, the last decade um, and we've also seen our markets shrink in the last decade. So we wanted to talk about where to from here. I think it's a very important discussion. And again, I wanna thank Shane Mahoney for prompting me to, uh, to gather you all together to, to talk about this. So the overall topic, again, uh, the Newfoundland seal hunt, where do we go from here? There are 7.6 million harp seals off of our coast, uh, according to uh, some of the late, latest research by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. The total allowable catch during the annual seal hunt has been, uh, for many years now, roughly about 400,000 harp seals. And we're talking specifically about harp seals. There are other um, total allowable catches for other species of seal, but we're going to talk about the most plentiful seal, which is a harp seal. Now, uh, Eldred Woodford and I had a chat the other day, and he told me that in the last decade or so, uh, the average uh, number of seals harvested has been around 40,000. So that's just about 10% of what we're actually allowed to take in this total allowable catch. So Eldred, let me start with you, first of all. Um, we've talked about w roughly how many uh, seals are taken on average. We've talked about uh, how many boats will be participating this year. That's, that's tw about 27 vessels to up to 32 vessels. Tell me what you know about the, the interest in this industry because harvesters have to do what's called a humane harvesting course to be able to participate. I'm curious about whether or not there are new entrants this year. Oh, yes, Jane. Uh, there is lots of interest. I mean, there'd be even more interest if we had a, a productive industry going. I mean, that's the problem with it all now is, is that industry has deteriorated to almost non-existent almost. I mean, with regards to numbers, when you look at only harvesting 10% of an allocation for the last decade, I mean, we had a period of time when we were harvesting full allocations with large number of sealers, large number of bullets, everybody making a good dollar for produ producing facilities here on the island, lots of people working. Having a little bit of a control to the population increase of that major predator that's there in our waters. But I mean, in the last decade, going on more than a decade now, we've failed to even be able to harvest our allocations because of the loss of our markets. And I mean, it's, it's, it's a real injustice. Well, no other word. It's a real injustice. How many, just to go back to, to the idea that you said that there are, there is, you know, interest in this industry. How many new entrants would you say were involved in that humane harvesting course this year, for example? Well, this year, for example, I was talking to the facilitator there a few days ago. And I mean, there's an in excess of 100 participants a year on humane harvesting uh, workshops in order to, I mean, even qualify to get a license. And I mean, this is a, on a very poor looking outlook with regards to this and we're still picking up hundreds there's new blood out there with full intentions of prosecuting this industry 
if it, if it, it could rebound and get back to a place where we were harvesting sustainable numbers for commercial activities and, and everybody making money at it. I mean, the chance is now of making money. You've got to have large numbers of seals and that's why there's only a few participants into it now because you just can't, everybody can't go out of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've identified the fact that, you know, not having markets is obviously a real deterrent uh, for this industry. I'm going to switch to Dion Dakins now, who can tell us more about that. Um, Dion, let's talk about what the market is right now for uh, sealed products. Maybe you can just sort of outline what, what the products are and, and where are our markets at this current time? We've historically seen that the, the seal harvest has been largely carried by um, the pelts. Uh, and then over a recent period of time, we've seen more value allocated towards the omega-3 oils for um, use as a, as a human supplement. Uh, they are essential fatty acids and they're, you know, very unique uh, and novel source as well because they are mammalian and, and are very helpful to the human body. The real issue hasn't been market demand. Um, the, the issues have been reaching our markets and reaching the consumers who have historically purchased and uh, you know further value added our products like like Jen and her uh, in her organization and other you know other companies that we sell to there, there is no lack of global demand for seal products um, if individually people were afforded the uh, the right to choose to buy seal products I think we'd see a very different scenario than what we see right now the challenge for us has been um, the barriers that have been put up by uh, national governments and, and unions of national governments, speaking about the, the uh, EU, uh, to, to really make it impossible to move the product on a realistic trade line. And uh, unfortunately, until we see some change in the, in the market access um, that we're afforded, um, we're going to have trouble internationally. Uh, luckily for us, there has been a lot of effort put into the Canadian market. Um, over the last 10 years, we've seen the Canadian market become more strong to us. Uh, there's been some education efforts put into the Canadian market. So I think there's a good example here in Canada that if people are presented with the right information, uh, that you defend that information and that information is, is you know, sustained and, and, and constantly move forward, that it does provide market opportunities. So at the moment, Jane, we're very much uh, domestically oriented uh, in our, you know, in all our planning because uh, there is really such uh, instability on the, on the international scene to try and move the products to market. Okay, this might be an appropriate time to remind people, of course, that that, that ban on seal products in the European Union uh, came in in 2010. So a significant amount of time ha has passed since then. And uh, a U.S. ban on seal products, of course, has been in place, I believe, since the, since the 1970s. Just want to switch now to, to Shane Mahoney, who does a lot of international uh, work and is in quite frequent contact with... Um, animal welfare groups. Shane, what can you tell us about whether or not attitudes are changing towards sustainable hunts like the seal hunt? What, what has been your experience? What are you hearing? Well, I think there's been a lot of change and the change is occurring in a lot of different areas. And many of those areas are not being tracked, uh, in my view, uh, very effectively. You can look at the seal hunt uh, in the context of the protests that occurred and the EU decision of 2010. Or you can look at the seal hunt in the context of a modern world where institutions like the Convention on Biodiversity, <clears throat> the intergovernmental policy platforms on science for biodiversity, uh, a host of other uh, international agreements that have emerged and strengthened in the last 20, uh, 10 to 12 years, all of which support the sustainable use of living resources. In addition to that, the United Nations itself and its sustainable development goals refer to the utilization and maximum utilization for the benefits of people of renewable natural resources for various things such as poverty reduction and so on and so forth. In other words, there has been a significant shift in recognizing the role of sustainable use of natural resources, not just from the point of view of benefiting human livelihoods and cultures, but also in terms of the benefits that are accruing to natural systems as a result of sustainable harvesting practices. And this has been reflected by a a significant growth in the academic literature dealing with things like recreational hunting, the value of wild meat, 
my own wild meat, uh, wild harvest initiative has become a major program. Um, so I think in terms of the global picture, a great deal has changed. And I don't think we have been effectively intersecting with that very much at all. And when I say we, I say we collectively, government, everyone. Um, in terms of the, the protest movement organizations, the animal rights, if you will, and animal welfare organizations, and it's very important to distinguish between the two. They're not the same. These organizations have not changed their views, particularly on something like a commercial harvest of seals, and for many reasons. But I will say that there is some greater, I would say, sort of understanding or acceptance of lower levels of harvest of animals than was the case when the protests were in their absolute heyday here over the seal hunt. One doesn't have to be utopian about this. Um, there are still lots of people who would be opposed to the reintroduction of a major kind of commercial hunt as we used to have in the past. But having said that, there are at our disposal now mechanisms and policies and international programs that did not, that did not exist when the protest began, that did not exist going all the way back to the Moore's administration when we began to fight it, and were not nearly as robust as even five or 10 years ago. And I do not think that the, personally, that the federal or the provincial government, and maybe the industry, Eldred and Dion and, and others, uh, I don't think certainly at the governmental level, there has been nearly enough attention paid to the opportunities that are out there, major, major global agreements signed by governments, including the EU governments, uh, in support of the sustainable use of living resources. So from my perspective, I think a great deal has changed. I want, I want to, to go back to many of the points you've raised there and, and get everyone's thoughts on um, you know, how we capitalize on, on this sort of shift in perspective about sustainability. Um, Jen Shears, you're someone who's on the front lines, really, of this industry with your store. Uh, you're selling seal fur products. You're, you're welcoming tourists into your store all the time. Tell me about the reaction that people had. We just heard from Dion Dakin saying that, you know, if there weren't e uh, bans in place in certain countries, that individuals would choose these products. I'm curious about the interactions that you have with people who aren't from here in particular, uh, about what you sell and about the seal hunt. What do they tell you? Yeah, so even though they're not allowed, they're still, in effect, choosing it. I would say... If not every week, every two weeks, I'm having to cancel an order from an international client um, that has come in online because they didn't read below to say, unfortunately, we can't send our products to certain countries. Apart from the ones that we think we might be losing, we know we're losing some sales because they're coming in and we're having to refund the money. Um, but our shop, you know, down on Water Street in the middle of the summer, it's quite intriguing to, to visitors who, um, either have heard about seal products or maybe they're just seeing it for the first time and it's quite beautiful and striking to see. So they're drawn in and we love the opportunity to further educate people um, on the seal harvest and really dispel any myths that are out there because we know there are a lot. Um, we've had interactions that began with, you should be ashamed of yourself. And by the time we have a civil, rational conversation, the people have ended up purchasing products and walked out with the, with the item and brought it back home to spread the positive messaging because, you know, they've really felt betrayed and misled over the years through the propaganda and hearing it from the, from the ground, from the people that are living it day in and day out and, and know it, they really appreciate having that perspective. So yeah, the, the demand is certainly there um, and the ones that we're able to sell to uh, we we try to do what we can to really capitalize on it and uh, encourage them to go back and spread the messages um, that they're able to to gain from us. Okay, I, I like what you're talking about there. Uh, the the power of conversation and and education within that conversation to to change mindsets and to open minds and really let people understand about. Uh, what's happening in this province and the opportunities that this industry could present for many communities. So let's, let's talk about that a little more fully now. What do you all think needs to happen, I guess, to, to educate more people in our own country 
uh, including our elected representatives who might then feel that they have the power to, to speak uh, more confidently on behalf of this industry. What do you think needs to happen to, to make the education uh, of this um, industry more widespread? Maybe, maybe Eldred, let's go back to you for a comment. I don't know. Like I said, I've been saying it for years. I mean, the demand is there for the products. And uh, if, the, if we had the market access for to get those products to market, the harvesting full allocations of seals, which would in turn provide lots of economic uh, return to coastal communities. I mean, we had, we had a decade and a half there where we were harvesting our full allocations and the market was crying for more. It was crying. The market was actually crying and DFO would never allow us to exceed our quotas. Eh? And I mean, then the EU ban started and everything turned bottom up from there on in. Eh? And we've been only harvesting now for the last decade, 10% of our resource. I mean, what a waste of a resource that's out there that there's so much need in Newfoundland for, 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 for this work, for this money. I mean, we once had four producers, four companies like Dion got there. Bidding, bidding. When sealers went to the ice, I mean, boats, hundreds. One, a few years, I'm, I'm almost sure we had over a thousand boats at the front one year. And I mean, lots of landsmen, everything productive, harvesting this. And Shane, it's never been a sustainable uh, question. We've, we've, we've haunted to the fullest extent there for a decade and a half. Population still increased. I mean, I watched this from the time I was a boy when back in the late 70s, early 80s. The landsmen rebuilt this hunt and it became so good. I mean, in the mid 90s to the early 2000s, like I said, sealing was my second biggest income next to crab. And I mean, in the last decade now, it's been turned bottom up. And I mean, a few are, are able to prosecute it. And thank God they try to keep what, what, what little product that Dion and them needs available to them. But I mean, it, it's a, it's a true crime by, and I just, I just can't say any more other than that. I mean, we, we're soon going to have to smarten up. And I mean, I, I, I know Shane understands this industry fully, but I mean, our politicians, and I don't know because we've, I've had 30 years of it and, and they come and go just every two or three, three or four years. And we hear the same thing at face value, but there's never nothing done behind the scenes so that this industry could prosper back to a heyday like it was. Because I mean, everywhere in the world that's got a seal population controls it. We kind of controlled it with a commercial hunt that put a value on the species itself. Seals were valuable to me t 10 plus years ago. Now they've become a nuisance. Now they've become a nuisance to an ecosystem where my commercial fisheries depend on something being done now, not waiting for something to be done in the future. And I don't know how long we're going to have the last or how long our life is left in rural Newfoundland as a fishing province because of that predator prey relationship. And it seems like it's falling on deaf ears all the time. Dan, maybe you can jump in here now again with the question about where we go to from here in terms of changing the mindset of, of uh, offering opportunities for, again, the public to support the industry and politicians to get behind the industry. What do you think needs to happen? You know, on an individual basis, when you, when you get someone one-on-one, -on -one, you can tear down a lot of the misconceptions. To my own view, and Eldred has described, you know, 30 years of involvement in this around um, what, is, what is kind of allowed what has rolled out to roll out is is largely political fear um whether it was in the eu or whether it's you know so a, a parliamentarian a member of the european parliament voting in favor of the ban in 2009 uh, which was largely you know huge effort put on by by anti anti-use groups uh created a fear so it was easy to vote against allowing the marketing of seal products in the eu when it comes to canada there's, there's a very obvious fear by um, the political level, not so much on a, on a local basis. So our members of parliament here in Newfoundland and Labrador are, are, are very supportive. Uh, in fact, champions nationally for what's happening. But when we get to the, to the central Canadian, um, you know, kind of, when it comes time for say Premier or Prime Minister Trudeau to speak up on ceiling issues, I mean, he's not present. And we do require top level leadership on this. And I, 
I think it comes back to Canada's uh, position on seals. You know, we, we don't advocate on a, on a federal level, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans does not advocate for seals, uh, for sealing, sorry. They simply manage a commercial fishery. And until seals are put into a, into a different context in the marine environment about, you know, what is the real relationship between uh, seals and fish? And when the, you know, chain has described multiple levers that exist for us to, to try and present um, the seal hunt in the context of, you know, people's understanding of, of ecosystem sustainability and marine sustainability and, and blue economy development. Um, you know, at the United Nations levels, largely most of our fish harvesters would qualify as peasants under the definition of, of a peasant and there should be afforded protection for people who want to use their local resources. And I, I think if the federal government uh, and the provincial governments, because I can't allow anybody to skate away from here, but we need to sit down collectively as an industry, as, as governments, and we need to strategize what, what are our core messages. And, and I think if the Canadian government itself did some public opinion polling in Canada, but what are the views of Canadians towards sealing and sealed uh, product marketing, I think they'd be very surprised by the outcomes. And I, I think they'd be encouraged to have a little more courage uh, to, you know, perhaps uh, put together a strategy and and start to pull and maneuver some of these levers that Shane has mentioned and uh, present the seal hunt in a new context because it's a very different situation we're dealing with today in terms of what actually happens at the harvest and the situation for the abundance of seals in our ecosystem that people are largely unaware of. Shane Mahoney, uh, let's go to you now about taking advantage. How do we take advantage of some of these changes in attitudes that you're seeing internationally? What are your thoughts on how we seize that opportunity? Well, first of all, I think it, it depends very much on whose mind you want to change. You have to be very clear about what the strategy involved in there is. My argument is that governments, including the national governments of Canada, and in many cases, state and provincial governments, are already signatories to international agreements, like the Convention on Biodiversity, uh, for example, like the Convention on Migratory Species, um, which commits them to the principles of those conventions, which in the case of the Convention on Biodiversity, it only has three principal pillars, and one of them is the sustainable use of living resources for the maximum benefit of people. So uh, we have, uh, in some instances, governments already committed to a principle that should apply to the Newfoundland <laughs> Sea Lot. Uh, and yet somehow that is being missed. It's not being talked about. It's not being referenced in any way. Eldred made a, a couple of comments that are really important. One was uh, this issue of describing it as injustice. Um, the whole United Nations move with what's called UNDRIP, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and more and more that includes local peoples. This is all about justice and about making sure that someone from afar does not impose unjust practices on, on individuals living in another place. Um, and secondly, the idea of sustainability is very important because when the World Trade Organization uh, did its review of the, uh, the ban from, from Europe, uh, you know, I wrote the letter for the IUCN that went back to the World Trade Organization when they made the decision that it, they would uphold it on public morality grounds. The IUCN, the largest conservation organization in the world, wrote the World Trade Organization and said, we disagree. There is a public morality that relates to giving people the opportunity to have sustainable livelihoods and to be able to harvest natural living resources in a sustainable way, obviously, which, as, as we well know, for 350 years, the Newfoundland seal hunt never imperiled the heart seal. So... I think that what is desperately needed and nothing short of this is going to work, you know, um, a public relations campaign, uh, you know, a nice set of, uh, you know, communication devices or something of this nature in and of itself will not be sufficient. We tried that all the way back to the Frank Moore's days. What really needs to happen is we need to have money, first of all, provided by the federal and provincial governments committed to this idea of reviving this, 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 this practice on the grounds of its cultural importance, on the grounds of its local importance to rural economies, 
and yes, on the building on the support for sustainable use of natural resources. And the industry and the provincial and the federal government should be, first of all, doing a, a, an overview study, an overview examination of all of these pieces that I'm referring to, to saying, how can we get in? There? How can we be represented in this way? What's the best way for us to get our viewpoint put forward? The EU is one block. They will be very, very hard. You know, you'd almost have to throw a bomb in the middle of that to really shake loose everything that's taking place in the EU. But from the outside, the EU is also signatory to the Convention on Biodiversity and the Convention on Migratory Species and all those principles that apply. Fortunately for us, we have the biological census data from DFO to indicate that the resource is very healthy. Even the World Trade Organization said there was no conservation concern here. There was no, no, no one needed to be concerned that we were over harvesting the seal population. But until we do the hard, heavy work of finding our way into those meetings, bringing representatives, representing the industry, representing us on the same, with the same language, the same clauses, the same resolutions that are in those international conventions to which our governments are signatories, that is what we have to find a way to do. The industry does not have this money. Dion doesn't have this money, Elder doesn't have this money, Jen, you don't have this money, I don't have this money, but we should be able, government should be concerned enough about this as a part of our heritage, as a part of our culture, and as part of our economies and local communities, that they should be doing a hell of a lot more with respect to this than they are. And while we might hope that Mr. Trudeau will eventually make some statement on something, I think we'll all be a lot older before he says anything bold about this particular plan. But it's not too much to expect that our own governments would make some kind of bold statement with respect to this. We have opportunities. I'm telling you, there is a new body formed called the Cooperative Partnership on Sustainable Wildlife Management. The, the Federation of Agricultural Organizations, the, the International Institute for International Development, the IUCN, Traffic, you know, CITES, they're all part of it. Their whole mission is to promote sustainable wildlife management of living biological resources. I sit on it. So, you know, we, we, have, we have ways of getting into these places to bring people like who are on this panel to develop workshops and plans and talk to politicians and policy leaders. Getting a public, you know, public profile of how many people support the Newfoundland seal hunt and all that kind of stuff. I think it's part of it. But on its own, it's not going to make enough of a difference. But if we can point to law and international policy that is on our side, we can then ask, get to ask the question, why, EU, are you in violation of international conservation policy? I was never so discouraged, Shane, back when CETA deal was being, uh, was being talked. I mean, the government was given they were giving it in their hands there. We presented it to them. We told them about all of these organizations that you just discussed with us. We, we give them the direction that we needed. But the first step was that our province was going to require to put the foot down and say, we got to have seals back on the table in order for we to keep our discussions in CETA. They didn't do it. So in turn, our federal ones didn't do it. So in turn, seals was left then lost in the wayside again. I mean, the difference in Newfoundland communities now in the spring of the year than what it was 40 years ago when I was a boy. I mean, speedboats coming and going full of seals, long liners coming and going full of seals. When I was a boy, I mean, that was that, geez, that was the happiest time of the year, being able to run around the communities and help out at wherever you could get your hands dirty at. But there's none of that anymore. But it could come back. It could come back. And it needs to come back. These are all excellent points you're making. And I think that what what that's going to take, though, and I think we have to start with ourselves, and I, I've even heard you say that to me, Shane, is that we, we all have to take an interest in this. Um, yes. You know, as a people, as a province, we have to take an interest in this, and we have to have the confidence to speak about it, uh, not just amongst ourselves, but, again, on, on uh, platforms that uh, are heard nationally, internationally. Um, Jen, maybe I want to go back to you. I'll just make one point before I, I, I raise this with you. Um, 
I often, when I cover the seal hunt or stories about the, the seal hunt, I, I often think back about uh, my experience that I had. Um, some of you recall, I, I traveled to Iceland and did a series of stories on the fishery there, comparing it to what happens here. I often ask myself when I'm confronted with hard questions about the fishery or, or the seal hunt, what would Iceland do? Uh, because I, I, that experience had such an impact on me that the people there are so confident. They are so willing to defend what is theirs. Uh, they're so um, willing to stand up for their culture and their rights. And I often think, what would Iceland do? What would they do if they had this harp seal population uh, off of their coast? I, I always come to the conclusion that everyone in Iceland would be wearing seal Everyone in Iceland would be eating seal. And Jen, do you hear that sentiment expressed by people who come into your store and say, I support the hunt and that's why I'm buying this hat or I, I want people to know that I'm passionate about this industry and that's why I'm buying this hat. What do people who are locals tell you about why they make the purchases they make? Yeah, that's certainly a, a huge part of it. They want to support it and nothing brings out a Newfoundlander or a Labradorian, like someone wanting to shut down what you believe in. So our sales skyrocket after protests and things like that, because it gets people riled up. But I feel unless folks around here really sense that what's happening with our industry is an injustice and is having a negative impact, you know, long term and is a real, a real problem um, that they might, they might not have that real initiative, um, with that at, at mind, you know, at heart. So, um, so yeah, they do, they want to support the industry. I don't really feel they think or realize what kind of dire straits it's in though, at this point. Um, I, uh, I attended the, uh, a few of the ceiling courses um, over the past few weeks and I found it to be really enlightening and really informative. And I even had our staff members attend them as well. And, you know, sometimes uh, when I think about the issues with people's perception on the seal hunt, do they have an issue with biodegradable products like like fur being one? No, they don't have an issue with biodegradable products. Do they have an issue with managing wildlife populations because they're overpopulated, eating themselves at a house and home and impacting other species? No, not necessarily. I think the optics of it are really what people are against large scale. And then when I took the courses on the three-step process for humane harvesting, I realized we're, we have the most ironic of a pickle in terms of our, our optics of the, of the seal hunt. The main issues that people see and what deters them from it is the barbaric nature of it, mainly from, I guess, the, the crushing of the skull and the bleeding. Those are the two things. But those are the two things that we do to ensure a humane harvest. So how do you reconcile those two things? The things that are really, um, vivid and stark for people are the things we do to ensure the harvest is done humanely. How do we, how do we reconcile those two things? Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a whole, a whole host of conversations that need to be had like on a local scale, but what Shane was saying about, you know, large scale global conventions and regulations that, that is, you know, the, the heart of it and that will spur global change. And then we can, change hearts and minds individually with those small scale messaging. Jen, you mentioned that you took part in some of the, the humane harvesting courses. Is it a goal of yours to take part in a hunt? Yeah, certainly. And I've taken part in harvests and hunts all around the world. I've witnessed many of them, different continents and everything. And I will say there's no other wild animal harvest that I have experienced or know of where you need to take a specific species specific training. Um, it, none of them are as regulated as, as the seal hunt. Um, but yes, Deanna and I have been in talks and hopefully um, through Eldred, I'll be able to get out there. And uh, yeah, it's my goal that I'll be part of it um, for many years to come. What would the, the potential be for this industry? Uh, Eldred talked about going back to the way that it was, but the potential for this industry, if we did take what we're allowed to take at this stage, 400,000 animals instead of just 10% of that, you know, 40,000. 40, How do we create a market even locally to be able to take so far what we're allowed to take? Uh, any thoughts on that? How we, we create more of a demand even amongst ourselves and then 
uh, you know, move beyond our borders and, and tackle some of these, uh, tackle the idea of maybe getting some of these bans reversed? Jane, I, I'll come in here real quick. Um, there are efforts already rolling out through the Canadian Seal Products uh, effort, which is under the Seals and Sealing Network of the of the Fur Institute of Canada. Uh, what I find interesting there is for, for everything we're generating, we're still not getting a lot of political engagement. We need our political uh, elected representatives. There has to be some political strength here to try and help reposition this in the context of Canadians. Um, overall, while this may be the world's largest slaughter of marine mammals, as it's often put, um, it's, it's a small industry in the global scale. I mean, even if we harvested, you know, 100% of the quota as it's offered to us, our omega-3s flowing out from that would represent 0.04% of the global supply of marine-based omega-3s. We'd, you know, fur-wise, I mean, and, and leather, we wouldn't even show up on the global scale. Um, so, I mean, while we may allow people to position this industry as being something large scale, even when it's at its maximum uh, capacity, you know, harvesting 350,000 animals per year, in the terms in a global context, it's it's a tiny industry. In uh, look at so look at what they do in Australia to control their kangaroo populations. We're 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 a blip on the screen compared to to those things that are required. So uh, I don't think we should automatically position ourselves as a big, um, you know, industry as a as a huge uh, <laughs> type of uh, you know massive slaughtering industry. This is relatively, it's conducted by small people in small communities. The flowback is to, directly to those small communities. And uh, yeah, really, we're, we're small scale. Shane, what do you think, though, about um, what what I can do, what Jane Aidy can do as an individual, what, what Shane Mahoney can do as an individual? I, I think you... When I interviewed you uh, several months ago about, uh, about Capelin, I think a, a lot of people gave me the feedback that you reminded them and in, in what you said that, um, you know, it's, it's not really up to the government. It is up to us. It is up to the people of the province to tell our elected representatives what we want. How do you think the average person in this province, whether it's by eating the meat or showing support for the industry, how does the average person of this province articulate or demonstrate to our elected representatives uh, what kind of change we want to see? I think in terms of what we can do ourselves, it's this is part of a much, much bigger problem, Jane and colleagues. Rural Newfoundland was and is it's a place where livelihoods were built around multiple components that came together and enabled people to live in originally very isolated circumstances, <clears throat> and even today in relatively isolated circumstances. You know, there isn't a hospital in every community in Newfoundland or something. So you're still, in a sense, there's a relative isolation. We have given over in Newfoundland so much of our identity, piece by piece by piece by piece. And we can blame politicians for this. You know, it's, 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 it's easy to say, you know, that's the liberals, that's the conservatives, that's premier so-and-so, that's, that's ministers such and such. But the bottom line is that the only way that rural Newfoundland can really survive is around renewable resources and a patchwork kind of lifestyle where people are capable at doing a lot of different things fairly well. And none of those single things make their life whole, but all of them together do. I think I have a sealskin vest. I have a sealskin jacket. You know, uh, you know, I, I do the little bit that I can. I, I bring people from away. We always serve them seal meat. I mean, you do, but you do the little things you can. But I also serve them moose, and I take them out to see Cape St. Mary's, and I talk to them about Bonavista, and I talk about our whales and our seabird colonies and all these kinds of things. You know, what what Newfoundland needs to be taken a hold of by the throat and shaken about all of this because a culture dies because one piece at a time is flicked away. We should be focusing to take your point, Dion, which is a very important one as well. We need to be careful about arguing about this as a mega industry. This is part of what killed us in the first place. We failed to argue maybe because we felt it wouldn't matter. 
we fail to argue about individual lives, small rural communities, small economies that had to have little pieces working together, poverty alleviation, human health, psychological health, emotional health, cultural health. We need to argue those things in the context of reviving the seal industry in Newfoundland and Labrador and just be a, a little bit careful about, you know, talking about it as a, as a, as a great big industry because that's what really stirs the negative reactions in a lot of people's minds. But all of this, Shane, all of this has been presented to our government has been presented to our politicians. We've been doing this for the last 12, 15 years, giving them the direction, showing them the way, but they could just wouldn't adhere to it. Eh? They wouldn't they wouldn't think to like to listen from industry. Dion knows as well as I know. I mean, we've been at this following this now for the last 20 plus years that I mean they pre they've been well presented with the way forward. Well then that raises a question, Elder. Because if they have been presented with all of this as a way forward and, and, and nothing has been done, then we have to figure out what's the missing piece. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe <laughs> a, a good way to round this out now. What is the missing piece? Because we started off with uh, the Newfoundland seal hunt. Where do we go from here? Jen Shears, what, what do you think the missing piece is? Or what are your thoughts on where to from here? I, I kind of want to leave people with maybe some instruction of how we can uh, move this forward. What do you think? What is the missing piece? Where do we go from here? For me, it always comes back to it being an abundant, renewable resource, yielding biodegradable, healthy products. And, you know, you've seen it even through the pandemic, like maybe a mind shift that has happened during the pandemic worldwide might be in our benefit because people are really now rooted in local things, um, in things that are sustainable and um, really tied to way of life and sense of place. So I think tying in all those themes, again, I think the large scale um, concepts of the conventions and the legislation are, are important, but I'm a firm believer of changing hearts and minds. Maybe that's where I feel I can make an impact um, one person at a time. And I think messaging, positive messaging around those things um, really is our way forward and can get us the, a foothold in certain places or certain groups where we might not have otherwise had it. Everyone has sort of remarked that we've tried a lot of things over time. And that to me is a really important point. If we have tried a lot of things over time and they haven't worked, there must be a reason. And so I really recommend to us that if we could find a way to bring together a group of people to re-examine, like people do a crime scene, you know, we haven't been able to solve it. We bring people back together again, we put it up on the board and we say, well, this is an advantage, this is a disadvantage, et cetera, et cetera. And we try to work through that and come up with a different strategy. I think that's our only hope going forward. Waiting for a miracle from governments or the EU is just not going to be. That seems like an appropriate uh, place to wrap up our discussion. I want to thank all of you very much for your time. Really interesting points raised here. Eldred Woodford, Dion Dakins, Jen Shears, and Shane Mahoney. Thanks very much for your input. And uh, I hope people take away some new ideas from our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jane. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Thanks, everybody.